Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Sultan Soud al Qasimi. He is at Yale as a visiting scholar in the Middle East Studies Council and is teaching a course on the politics of modern Middle Eastern art. Mr. al Qasimi is a columnist and researcher on social, political, and cultural affairs in the Arab Gulf states. He is also the founder of the Bargeel Art Foundation. Today we'll talk with Mr. Al Kasame about modern Middle Eastern art and architecture. Welcome, Sultan. Thank you. Let's start um, with talking about the course you're teaching here. Uh -huh. What are you teaching the students? Well, as you said in your introduction, I'm teaching a class on the politics of modern Middle Eastern art. Mm -hmm. We look at the 20th and the 21st century across the Middle East. So we look at North Africa. So we look at the Arab world, mm -hmm. Egypt, Syria, Iraq, all the way to Morocco, the Gulf states. Uh, but we also look at Israel, uh, Iran, and Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we try and study the intersection of art and politics, how artists reacted to major political events, wars, revolutions, but also to social movement, women, women emancipation movement, labor movements. And, and what not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we try and study this region through an artistic lens, uh, whereas it's been always studied through a political lens. Okay. And what uh, years are you looking at? I know it's modern, but what does that mean in terms of? We really look at the early 20th century. Okay. Th there was a major event that took place around 1906 mm -hmm. where there was a religious decree that said that art is okay and art is allowed and it's no longer for forbidden. And mm -hmm. so you have the advent of the first uh, university that teaches art in a systemic system okay. in Egypt and Cairo in early 20th century. So we almost take that as our starting point and we go all the way to the Arab Spring and well into the 21st century. Okay, so um, I would venture a guess that most Westerners do not know much about modern Middle Eastern art. So what are some of the things that you might point out um, as differences or maybe even similarities that we wouldn't be aware of? I would say that most Middle Easterners aren't aware of modern Middle Eastern art. <laughs> it's such a, a, a new um, a scholarship uh, and a new um, you know, space mm -hmm. that we're still exploring it. Okay. Um, people are surprised when I tell them after 15 or 20 years of reading and exploring Middle Eastern art that I don't know about a certain artist. Actually, mm -hmm. it makes me happy to discover that there's so much that I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would say that a lot of people aren't aware how active the women's artist movement was uh, throughout the Middle East, all the way back to the early 20th century. A lot of people aren't aware of the ethnic minorities, religious minorities, uh, Jewish artists, Christian artists, minorities, mm -hmm. um, ethnic minorities, uh, uh, how active they were, uh, and all the cross-cultural exchange that the region has had with South Asia, India, uh, with Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, with the Mediterranean Basin, mm -hmm. uh, the Caucasus. Uh, and so it is such an eclectic part of the world mm -hmm. that people, I think, uh, would really be uh, uh, you know, positively surprised to find out how, how varied it is. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the art itself, is it paintings as well as sculpture? It runs the whole gamut, yes? Oh, we do art. look at uh, painting, sculpture, but also film. Okay. We look at uh, photography, uh, poetry. There's so much uh, to think of, but we're, of course, I have, to, I have to emphasize that we're just touching upon these subjects mm -hmm. rather than really delving deep into them. Okay. And you um, recently created um, an art foundation, the Bargeel Art Foundation. I'll talk a little bit about that and why you thought it was necessary to establish it. So I had been collecting art since 2002. So it's, a, it's almost 17 years now. And uh, I always wanted to, to have a home. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I started collecting art and, and I lobbied uh, m my local government back home in the emirate that mm -hmm. I come from. And they had given me a space uh, for a good eight year period. And now the works are on long term display at the Sharjah Art Museum. And Sharjah is the emirate in the UAE where I come from. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful museum dating back to the 1990s. And they have been very, very generous uh, with giving me the space uh, so that we can have a long term display. Mm -hmm. And this is a challenge, Marilyn, that we face in the Arab world where 
Middle Eastern art isn't really uh, on, put on long-term display. We really suffer from this issue called short-term exhibitions, mm -hmm. uh, which is wonderful, but in reality, you don't have a chance to develop a long-term relationship. Think of yourself when you, go, when you went with maybe your parents or your family to visit a, a museum exhibition, maybe at the MoMA, mm -hmm. and then you go, and maybe you take your kids or you take your nephews right, right. or your nieces, and then so it's a generational relationship. Mm -hmm. We don't have this ah. in the Middle East. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Right, right. You know, in fact, you mentioned the MoMA. I recently went there with my daughter, and I was very surprised as part of um, one of their exhibits. They did have um, modern Middle Eastern art exhibited there. Have you seen that? Indeed, I have. Yes, and they have a little note about why it's so, so important to show this art. Um, so I understand your point on that um, precisely. So how many, um, how big, how many paintings are exhibited um, in the museum. Oh, right now, the long-term display at the mm -hmm. Sharjah Art yes. Museum has about 140 works. Okay. Although we are now launching a few short-term exhibitions coming here to the US, mm -hmm. and so some of the works will be leaving the museum and they will be exchanged over the next year or mm -hmm. so. Uh -huh. Very good, very good. Um, and you mentioned um, uh, your hometown, and I know you're working on a book project about its architecture. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that and why it's so important to you to um, to recognize this architecture? So um, I'm really interested in modernism. I'm interested in uh, documenting and archiving the near history, rather than the ancient history, mm -hmm. in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, not only in art, but also in architecture and other, um, you know, and, and other sort of fields of, uh, of culture. Mm -hmm. And so I noticed that the cultural heritage, the architectural heritage, of Sharjah in the UAE isn't documented. Mm -hmm. That a lot of the buildings that were designed by American architects, like the Architects Collaborative, a firm that was founded here in the US uh, in the 1940s by Walter Gropius, designed a building, actually a number of buildings across the Gulf in Sharjah. Uh, these buildings have never been documented properly. Mm -hmm. And so these are important world heritage sites, I believe dating back to half a century that mm -hmm. deserve to be documented. Some of them are being knocked down, Marilyn, unfortunately, and this is something that we see in major cities around the world. Uh, this challenge of identifying which building is worthy of saving and which building you, know, you just have to let go of. Right. And so for me, rather than try to champion the preservation only, of these buildings, at least we try to get them documented mm -hmm. for future generations. Right, right. Are there any um, characteristics of the architecture that are similar? Oh, so a lot of these architects that came to the UAE, this is before the UAE was founded as a country in 1971. They came in the 1950s and 60s, and they came in from Europe, from North America. Mm -hmm. They came in from across the Middle East, but also from South Asia. And they had to adapt to the in, uh, the environment, and the environment is hot, the environment is humid, the environment is dry, mm. and so the architecture had to adapt. And also, the fact that the material wasn't readily available. You just don't have access to concrete and cement. Right. So what you have to build with is you reuse a lot of wood. Uh -huh. And I, that was something that was so interesting for me, that mm -hmm. doors would be removed from houses and then reused in other houses. That you see the material that has more than one life span. And I see this is something that was so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a gate that was designed for a house is now being used in a building. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I thought, well, quite, quite interesting for the mid 20th century down there. Right, right, because today that's kind of um, on point. It's a trend for sustainability reasons to reuse some um, products. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I know you uh, just launched a competition, an architecture competition. So talk a little bit about that. So uh, we, I've come to an agreement with this major uh, architectural award, and they heard me complain about you know, the lack of opportunity for, for me to, having, to have a museum that mm -hmm. is permanent for the collection. Right. Because I always consider the collection to be public. Mm -hmm. I always consider myself to be an administrator of a collection. I never say this art belongs to me because mm -hmm. I feel like you know, whatever long my lifespan is, I really hope this life, that this, this work lives for generations and maybe hopefully centuries ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I'd, I, my dream was to build a, um, 
you know, a structure that houses this, this collection. Uh, and so we, we just decided to launch this competition. It doesn't mean I have the money to build the museum, mm -hmm. but I wanted to get the public interested in sure. this idea. And it's only, been, it's only been launched recently, but so far the um, feedback has been very positive mm -hmm. uh, because I'm calling on people to look at the entire region uh, and draw inspiration from North Africa, from the Levant, from the Gulf, mm -hmm. uh, from West Africa, from the entire region when they propose an architectural landmark that houses this collection. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you particularly would like to see incorporated into the design? Let me or would that be, you know, a spoiler <laughs> alert? That is a spoiler alert, but <laughs> the less glass, the better. Okay. Because, I, you know, I also think of the environment, mm -hmm. and I don't like the idea of these glass houses that sure. are being built in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. there's, there's too much use of glass. And I, I'd like us to look back into what we talked about a few minutes ago about environmental consciousness, about being aware of the environment of these cities and these, you know, these regions that we inhabit, and hopefully have a building that's not just an architectural landmark, but also, uh, you know, a building that we can uh, look forward to in the future mm -hmm. and say this was a building that took the environment to, into consideration. Right, right. Well, we will look forward to seeing the outcome of that competition, hopefully in the near future. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me, Marlon. For more information about Mr. Al Kasimi, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.